Hello and welcome to Indus News. Live from Islamabad, I'm Naila Shudra and these are the headlines. The Buckingham Palace says Prince Philip has died at the age of 99 at Windsor Castle. He was hospitalized earlier this year and underwent a successful heart surgery. Pakistan has called for international investigations into the extrajudicial killings of Kashmiri people by the Indian forces. At a press briefing, Foreign Office spokesperson Zahid Hafiz Chaudhary said India must allow the UN bodies and international media to assess the human rights situation in the occupied valley. Indian forces have killed seven Kashmiri civilians during so-called search and operations since yesterday. Myanmar troops have killed 10 more people after they opened fire on protesters rallying against the February 1st coup near Yangon. But the military claimed that the protest campaign is dwindling and said it would hold elections within two years. Envoys from 18 countries have urged the generals to restore democracy and shun violence as the death tolls from the crackdown soars to above 600. Iran's Foreign Minister Javad Zarif has once again called for the lifting of U.S. sanctions. Zarif wrote on Twitter that Iran will honor the 2015 nuclear deal once the U.S. returns to the accord. His tweets come after China and Russia, and the EU said progress has been made during the second round of talks to revive the deal in Vienna. They said all sides would reconvene next week. India has again reported record-high single-day COVID-19 cases as 131,000 people tested positive overnight. In Pakistan, 105 people lost their lives to the virus and more than 5,300 people tested positive overnight. Globally, the virus has claimed nearly 2.9 million lives and infected over 133 million others. For more news and details, stay tuned. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. The Buckingham Palace says Prince Philip has died at the age of 19 at Windsor Castle. He was hospitalized earlier this year and underwent a successful heart surgery. Philip played a lead figure in the British royal family for nearly seven decades. Condolences started pouring in from around the world as soon as the news of Prince Philip's demise was reported. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he would be remembered for his steadfast support for the Queen. U.S. President Joe Biden paid a rich tribute to the prince, saying his legacy will live on not only through his family, but in all the charitable endeavors he shaped. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, and the leaders of Australia and New Zealand also extended their condolences to the royal family. In his condolence message, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan said Britain has lost a wise elder. Prince Philip married Princess Elizabeth in 1947 and played a pivotal role in modernizing the monarchy in the post-World War II period. His last appearance came in July last year at a ceremony at Windsor Castle, where he and the Queen have resided during the lockdowns. Pakistan has called for international investigations into the extrajudicial killings of Kashmiris by Indian forces. At a press briefing, Foreign Office spokesperson Zahid Hafiz Chaudhary said India must allow the UN and international media to assess the human rights situation in the occupied valley. The call for the probe comes after Indian forces killed seven people during so-called search operations in 24 hours. The region has been under a curfew and communications blackout after India revoked its special status in August 2019. Hundreds of people have been killed since then. 
And Myanmar's security forces have shot dead another 10 protesters in the city of Bago near Yangon. According to a rights group, the military has killed over 600 protesters and detained nearly 3,000 since the February 1st coup. Despite the violence, civilians across the country are rallying again today against the military coup. But the junta claims the protest campaign is dwindling since people want peace. In a news conference, a junta spokesperson said government ministries will resume full operations soon. Brigadier Zaw Min Chun said that the election must be held within two years. He said reports that the international community did not recognize the military government are fake. Meanwhile, 18 envoys to Myanmar issued a joint statement calling for the restoration of democracy. Iran's Foreign Minister Javad Zarif has once again called for the lifting of U.S. sanctions. Zarif wrote on Twitter that Iran will honor the 2015 nuclear deal once the U.S. returns to the accord. His tweets come after China, Russia and the EU said progress has been made during the second round of talks to revive the deal in Vienna. They said all sides would reconvene next week. The talks are being intermediated by the EU. But the U.S. and Iran do not expect fast breakthroughs in indirect negotiations. Seoul says that Iran has released the South Korean ship and captain it detained amid a dispute over frozen funds. This came hours before the start of negotiations between Iran and world powers in Vienna over the nuclear deal. In a statement, Seoul's foreign ministry said the staff is in good health and the ship has departed Iran. There has been no confirmation from Tehran yet. Iranian authorities seized the Hankook Shimi and its multinational crew of 20 sailors in January. They accused the vessel of polluting the Strait of Hormuz. Tehran has repeatedly denied that the seizure of the vehicle was linked to the fund's issue. Iran says it will undoubtedly respond to the attack on its ship in the Red Sea once it identifies its culprits. The Savez was hit by a limpet mine on Tuesday and has allegedly been used by Iran's Revolutionary Guards as a command and control center. Iran's military spokesperson said that Iran will make a move after its investigations are concluded with utmost accuracy. In an interview, the spokesperson said Iran suspects Israel and the U.S. to be the perpetrator of the attack. He said U.S. has been involved in all attempts to undermine and harm Iran. However, the U.S. earlier denied responsibility for the attack. Yemen's Houthis rebels claim that they have hit Saudi warplanes in an armed drone attack at the Jazan airport. However, the Saudi-led Arab coalition has denied the claims, saying it destroyed the drone before it could hit its target. In a statement, coalition spokesperson Tulki al-Mulki said that the drone was intercepted over Yemeni airspace. The spokesperson added that it's Houthis' second such strike within a day. Meanwhile, Houthi spokesperson said the designated target has been hit with high precision. The UN Human Rights Office has expressed concern over Jordan's lack of transparency surrounding at least 16 detentions. In a news briefing, a UN Human Rights Office spokesperson said no charges against the arrested persons have been brought yet. Marta Hurturdu said that this is not yet clear if Jordan's Prince Hamza is still in de facto house arrest. This comes days after King Abdullah said sedation had been quashed after a rift with the prince. Hamza was accused of plotting with foreign entities to destabilize the kingdom. The former heir to the throne denies conspiracy, but he has accused Jordan's leaders of corruption. Moscow has warned Kiev of military intervention if any Russian citizen in the eastern Ukraine is harmed. President Deputy Chief of Staff Dmitry Kozak says the beginning of the hostilities will be the beginning of the end of Ukraine. In an interview, Kozak said it is a self-inflicted wound, a shot not in the leg but in the face. He added the intensity of Moscow's reaction depends on the heat of the situation. Meanwhile, Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, was at Donbass and said 26 servicemen have been killed this year. Clashes between Ukrainian troops and the Moscow-backed rebels have intensified recently. While Russia has been increasing the number of troops at the Ukrainian border, the U.S. says Russia's military buildup is the largest since 2014, when it annexed Crimea and backed separatist territory seizures. 
White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said Washington is discussing its concerns with its NATO allies. Earlier in a phone call, German Chancellor Angela Merkel also asked Russian President Vladimir Putin to pull back the troops. At least 11 Nigerian soldiers have been killed in an attack on a patrolling party in central Benue state. In a statement, an army spokesperson said the troops were initially declared missing while on a routine operational task. But he said such a search and rescue team later found the bodies of one officer and 10 soldiers. He said efforts are ongoing to track down the perpetrators of this heinous crime to bring them to justice. Troops routinely patrol in Nigeria's middle belt as enduring clashes between farmers and herders have reignited recently. India has again reported record high single day COVID-19 cases as 131,000 people tested positive overnight. Globally, the virus has claimed nearly 2.9 million lives and infected over 133 million others. More in this report. With scary new variants challenging vaccine effectiveness and economic disparity across nations affecting immunization drives, it is hard to tell how long it would take to contain COVID-19. The worst hit Latin America and the Caribbean are struggling to inoculate populations. Economic wiles in these regions add fuel to the fire, as a new study revealed that the pandemic has unemployed one in every six adults aged 18 to 29. Brazil has recorded its highest daily deaths as 4,249 people lost their lives overnight. Brazil's Senate is set to open an investigation into President Jair Bolsonaro's pandemic response. Meanwhile, the U.S. has donated field hospitals to Argentina to boost efforts to combat the spread of the virus. This ceremony highlights the steadfast partnership between the United States and Argentina in combating COVID-19. The Western Hemisphere is our shared home our neighborhood and what we're doing here is being good neighbors and assisting each other. The United States and Argentina share the same democratic values such as respect for the rule of law, free and fair elections and human rights. Although the UK's vaccination program and the lockdown have led to a 60% drop in infections, the World Health Organization has warned that it is not enough to protect Britain from another wave. Netherlands, Portugal, the Philippines and Australia are the latest countries to limit the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine, dealing further blows to the company's hopes to deliver a vaccine worldwide. The planning from the vaccination. We do not expect this to have a major impact on the vaccination operation. We are aiming to have given at least a first shot to people with an increased risk. So everyone who is 60 or older and people with an increased medical risk by the second half of May. We do not expect any major changes to that plan. Australia has already announced plans to purchase 20 million doses of Pfizer's vaccine. Meanwhile, India is investigating potential domestic cases of blood clots as a side effect of vaccines. COVID-19 has claimed another 105 lives in Pakistan and infected over 5,300 people in the past 24 hours. The health ministry says the nationwide death toll has reached 15,229. It said the country's positivity ratio has dropped to 9.66 percent, but the number of active cases is approaching 70,000. The ministry said a total of nearly 711,000 cases have been detected so far. It noted out of these, almost 626,000 have recovered. Meanwhile, Pakistan's Drug Regulatory Authority has granted emergency use authorization to the third Chinese vaccine, Coronavac. It's now time for a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. In the northern Irish capital of Belfast, violent clashes among unionist, nationalist and police over post-Brexit rules continued for the seventh consecutive night. 
Police used water cannons to disperse demonstrators who threw petrol bombs and stones on the security forces. Around 100 people attacked police armored vehicles in a Irish nationalist area. The U.S. State Department has voiced concerns over the mounting tensions, calling for political and economic stability in the area. Um, as I said before, President Biden has been unequivocal in his support uh, for the Belfast uh, and Good Friday Agreement, uh, which was an historic uh, achievement. Uh, we believe that we must protect it, uh, and we believe that we must ensure it doesn't become a casualty of Brexit. Turkey has summoned the Italian ambassador over the Italian premier's remarks about President Tayyip Erdogan. Mario Draghi has called the president of Turkey a dictator at a news conference on Thursday. Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu also urged Draghi to take back his unacceptable remarks. This follows a diplomatic row that erupted over seating arrangements in Erdogan's meeting with European leaders. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen was left without a seat during the talks in Ankara. The United States says it has to modernize the country's nuclear arsenal. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm says the U.S. will maintain the stockpile to make sure that it is safe and effective. At a press briefing, she said the nuclear deterrent is important and it is embedded in the values of that stockpile. Granholm added that the U.S. will continue to keep arsenal to deter any aggression from other countries. She said Washington will make sure that Americans are safe. China has slammed the U.S. ban on seven supercomputing entities with alleged links to the Chinese military. The foreign ministry said Beijing will take necessary measures to protect the rights and interests of its companies. Spokesperson Zhao Lijian said the U.S. suppression cannot hold back China's scientific and technological development. Earlier, the U.S. Commerce Department accused the companies of assisting Chinese military efforts. In a statement, Commerce Secretary Gina Riamondo said that these supercomputing capabilities are vital for nuclear and hypersonic weapons. Soyuz MS-18 carrier rocket has blasted off from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan with a manned spacecraft. Russian state media said the spacecraft will deliver two Russians and one NASA astronaut to the International Space Station. The experts will spend six months working on biology, biotechnology and earth science experiments. The launch marks 60 years of human spaceflight with a Soyuz named after Yuri Gagarin, the first person to reach space. China has successfully launched an experimental satellite from the Taiyuan Center in northern Shanxi province. The satellite, the third of the Saiyan 6 series, was launched by a Long March 4B carrier rocket. It will carry out space environment surveys and experiments on related technologies. The launch marks the 365th mission by the Long March rocket series. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has warned citizens to prepare for hard times, following warnings of food shortages. Addressing a party conference, he called on officials to make all possible efforts to relieve the difficulties faced by the people. Earlier this week, Kim warned that the country is facing the worst ever situation and multiple challenges. Last month, the UN Special Rapporteur had also warned about a serious food crisis in North Korea. An estimated total of 3 million North Koreans have died due to starvation. The country has suffered famine during the 1990s after Soviet Union's fall left it without crucial aid. In Egypt, archaeologists have unearthed a large pharaonic city which has led to seen unseen centuries for years. It has termed the discovery a window into the ancient world. Archaeologists say the newly unearthed city was built over 3,400 years ago during the reign of Amenhotep III. The streets of the well-preserved city are flanked with houses having almost complete walls, some up to three meters high. The rooms are filled with various tools and mud bricks bearing seals of Amenhotep's kartosh. Experts have called for the need to preserve the area as an archaeological park. Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg says she will not be attending the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow this year. 
The summit will bring together world leaders with the aim of agreeing on a plan to tackle climate change. In an interview, Thunberg said the reason is the inequitable rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine. She urged that the even rollout means that countries might not participate on the even terms. The campaigner said she does not rule out reversing her decision if vaccine access improved. The last two conferences of the party summits have had more than 20,000 attendees. The event was originally planned to be held in November 2020 and has already been postponed due to the coronavirus. In Mexico City, the house of renowned British painter, sculptor and writer Lenora Carrington has been transformed into a museum. After three years of refurbishments, including structural reinforcement, the house is now ready to receive academics. More on this report. The townhouse in the Roma neighborhood was inhabited by the wise Carrington family for more than 60 years. She fled to Mexico City in 1942 and married Hungarian photographer Chicky Wise and had two sons, Pablo and Gabriel. Pablo had convinced his mother to turn the house into a museum after her death. In 2017, Wise was able to sell the house to the Metropolitan Autonomous University, which started to document and catalog items inside and to develop a museum project. We found a collection of texts, we found underlined phrases in textbooks, we found drafts of artwork. All these are findings that definitely, for the right person, for researchers, will be useful to explain many things with regards to who Leonora Carrington really was and where she got her inspiration from. In total, the studio house holds 8,600 catalogued objects, including books, furniture, photographs and incomplete sketches of her artworks. Visitors will be able to tour the rooms where the artist kept her records and handwritten messages, as well as personal items such as her spectacles and wristwatch. The university hopes the museum will become a useful source of information for students and academics. Regardless of the place of birth of Leonora's first training, of joining the ranks of surrealism. It seems to me it is part of the Mexican cultural panorama and that, therefore it is of absolute importance to get to know her, to know her life, knowing how she thought, knowing how she spent her days, in order to understand a woman who in many ways was ahead of her times. Carrington's work was among the best selling for a living surrealist. She is famous for her paintings of women and mythical beasts. A rebellious aristocrat, she also went on to win international recognition as a sculptor, painter and writer. Christie's auction house sold one of her tempera on wood panel paintings for $1.48 million in 2009. It's now time for a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Bolivia's Uru Uru Lake has more plastic than water, filled with discarded bottles, containers and tires. This has inspired local volunteers, workers and even a French influencer to try and clean up the mess. More on this report. Discarded plastic as far as the eye can see. This is a dystopian image reflecting years of human pollution at the Uru Uru Lake. The lake suffered a drought in 2016, lowering its water levels and causing the rivers flowing into it to deposit mountains of plastic waste. It has prompted hundreds of people to gather up waste from the surface of the lake. It's a shame that so much garbage has come here because it has accumulated in many years, perhaps a decade. Now we have to think about the future. Let's clean and then we become aware so that we don't have to clean again. Bolivia's highland lakes are major sites protected under the International Ramsar Convention to Conserve Wetlands. The iconic Lake Titicaca is grappling with pollution. Walego Pupu dried up completely in 2015. Limbert Sanchez, an environmental engineer, blames urban and industrial expansion for the flow of pollutants into the lake. 
si prácticamente nuestro lago Uruguay's water levels had been reduced to around 25 to 30 percent of its full capacity. For that reason, we only see a dry plain. Climate change is affecting, and this is a fundamental aspect that must be taken into account. Then there is mining pollution and urban pollution. Cities are growing, pollution by garbage is growing, and gradually that means our lake Uruguay is dying, just like our lake Pupo. As dump trucks hauled away heaps of rubbish, volunteers hold out hope that one day they will be able to restore the beauty of the lake. The Wall Street stocks have opened higher as the markets wrapped up the week on solid gains. The banks and the industrial shares have gained on optimism around the strong U.S. economic growth. The indices of S&P 500 and the DJI traded fractionally up, but Nasdaq Composite was down over quarter of a percent. Moreover, President Joe Biden is set to release his first budget proposal to Congress later in the day. Meanwhile, oil prices edged up in early Asian trade as investors await the impact on fuel demand from the COVID-19 pandemic. In golf, Englishman Justin Rose tamed a windy Augusta National to hold a four-shot lead after the first round of the Masters. Rose was two over after seven holes but went on a scorching run to card a seven under par 65 that marked his career low at Augusta National. This left him four shots clear of his closest pursuers, Japan Hideki Matsumamiya and American Brian Harmon. He was one of the only three players in the field to break 70 in the opening round. Meanwhile, defending champion Dustin Johnson was among a number of top players who struggled in challenging conditions. Climbing will be making its debut at the Olympics by being part of the Tokyo Summer Games scheduled for this summer. Team USA will be sending four young climbers to compete at the event. A total of 40 climbers, 20 from each gender group, will be participating at the Tokyo Olympics. Athletes will be competing in a combined format featuring three disciplines. Bouldering and lead will be based on difficulty, while the third one, speed, focuses on time. The International Olympic Committee added the sport during the 129th IOC session in Rio de Janeiro in 2016. It's now time to take a look at the weather around the world. For the latest news updates, you can follow us on our social media at indus.news.